Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. There we go. go ahead, Dave. No worries. No worries. Go, good Dave. morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. I'm very humbled, honored, and grateful that we are again joined uh, today, uh, joining with us, Mr. Winter, who, again, whose work is I have tremendous, tremendous respect for. And today, I don't mean to put any words in his mouth. I think we'll be discussing some very, very interesting topics, perhaps even uh, a little more uh, elaborative and interesting than the previous episode. So, sir, uh, how are you doing today? And the floor is yours. <laughs> yes, uh, well, uh, as everybody knows, I'm Dan Winter, FractalField.com. I'm talking with Dave from Generation Z, and we've had so much fun. Actually, Jay, Dave sent me an inquiry the other day. He said uh, he had been studying n-dimensional vector distribution. And I said, yes. oh, what a great introduction to the physics of God. <laughs> wow, nice. <laughs> awesome. Actually, you know, we, we did... Um, we did a short history of God. Uh, we were a play on words, a short history of time. And the short history of, of God uh, video uh, went viral. It was fun. And so today's video is called The Short Physics of God. <laughs> Amazing. Love it. Uh, uh, as in, if you are an electrical engineer and you wanted to know what Holy Ghost, Great Spirit, Divine Mind, Supreme Intelligence, or, quote, God is, do we have a clue? And if we really understood then we should be able to do it better. <laughs> right. But actually, uh, Dave started this evening's conversation by telling me about watching someone do spoon bending. And I think that might be quite relevant, actually. Dave, you want to just tell a story briefly? Yeah, absolutely. So essentially, there were some, uh, basically, I, I was in the, um, I guess, uh, graced with the uh, presence of witnessing some very, I guess you could say, um, uh, magic uh, well you could call magical uh you know what people would say fringe out of this world type thing and and i couldn't help but think again going back to the concept of perhaps maybe this is not the most appropriate example but the the film the matrix when neo sees uh the the child bending the spoon and is told the child can bend the spoon because the child re realizes there is no spoon and so <laughs> that made me wow and then you know i watched uh, i saw you know another another uh item bent and then another thing that in pure theory of physics can't be possible with human strength so i was and you said yeah. something about the the psychology of how they described being able to do that didn't you yes the concept of basically what what mr winter is saying of, of non-destructive implosion pertaining to they both um commanded and also asked the uh the, the spoon to bend but they dissolved their ego to the point where they basically gave everything they had within them at this at what you could call the center point and yeah. that or the middle ground and they said they said please but at the same time it's going to happen because i'm manifesting it both and neither requests were were occurred and then that's when it bent so that the as the total relaxation charge collapse uh, brings the attention to a focus you get a, a tremendous amount of leverage from that point of focus obviously and that ability to bend then at the even atomic level means that you're actually bending an array with a centripetal force which has come actually to the Planck threshold in terms of fineness and resolution uh, so essentially you're identi I -fi, identifying with the actual atoms of that spoon which are actually part of your mind at that point and by the way with this this would predict some very interesting things for example we should be able to measure a brainwave, a heart rate variability, breath frequency signature correlating to implosion of the moment of enabling. And by the way, we're about to announce an incredible advance to flameandmind.com brainwave bliss uh, binaural measuring software where we can measure the heart rate variability, breath, uh, Mayer wave, and liquid ventricle, low frequency heart rate breath waves right on the same graph with the brain waves and show the moment of the Mayer wave and the brain ventricles. So we have a whole new level of biofeedback for teaching heart, breath, low frequency HRV entrainment with the brain waves, which both should indicate that moment of implosion when you get that leverage on the still point. Good. Can I, I just want to say one last thing, if that's all right. Initially, what happened was that uh, the, this, this individual had bent a pen and I was like, okay, I mean, with the utmost respect, not to, you know, to this person, not, not to be a skeptic or anything like this, but could you do something a little more sturdy, perhaps? They pulled out a spoon, they did it, then they pulled out a fork and they did it. So, I mean. 
And see, there should be some very interesting physics here that higher dielectric materials should enable the inhabiting of the plasma vortex with mindfulness, which is a phase conjugate array inhabiting, uh, meaning that you know, if you ever saw a shaman playing with psychoactivity, he would normally use biologic materials. And into that, more mindfulness can inhabit. Whereas a fork, <laughs> you're actually focusing your heat in something that has the wrong dielectric and therefore implosion is not supported. So theoretically, the physics would predict that if you're playing with metal, uh, your aura is not going to gain inertia by inhabiting it. Whereas if you're playing with biologic material, your, your aura can actually gain inertia by doing. So there's a whole level of meaning. Wow. And, and this, I suppose, brings up what I was hoping to chat about this evening, which was if we really understood the short physics of God, <laughs> right. you know, maybe we could do it better. I mean, maybe we could leverage our environment. You know, we've been talking about steering tornadoes for years. And actually, I must say, from my personal experience, I sat with this lady, her name is Diana, actually, Diana locally, who's been training with Tibetans for many, many years, a lifetime. And we sat to dinner with her prayer, and I literally felt the wind when she prayed. I mean, I literally felt the, the magnetic wind blow when she prayed. This is an older lady who's, you know, a bit of a saint. And, and my grandmother, by the way, is famous for being able to call the rain when she wanted to. You know, So why is it that some people can call the wind? You know, mm. obviously, every indigenous person, every Native American Indian believed in the great spirit, Wakantanka. And uh, my partner, Valerie, teaches the Ananda Marga tradition. And their whole point is that if you haven't identified literally with the supreme intelligence, then you haven't done anything important. <laughs> so, you know, this is all seems like useful and appropriate advice from very wise ancient peoples. But how do electrical engineers understand? How do you get aligned with the divine intelligence? And that's what this conversation is supposed to be about. The electrical engineering of God, as it were, which is how does this great spirit inhabit? And um, so we use the Tibetan example, the Indian example, the Aboriginal example, when you see them, you know, when the Aboriginal elder dies and you see the storm up the magnetic line of their ancestors song line and that storm crosses the continent the day actually it's auntie lorraine died and we watched that storm which was triggered by her death on that song line and so we know these great large plasma winds are embedded in our biology under certain circumstances now, remember, the, those indigenous peoples where they were living on that same magnetic line for 100 generations, and there was a great fractal relationship between the fold density in their DNA, walking barefoot on, versus the, the braiding in the land and the braiding in the DNA. That was embeddability. That was fractality. That's real grounding. So if you walk barefoot on the same magnetic line for 100 generations, probably that magnetic line knows you and right. could be steered by you. It makes total sense. In fact, you know, I also watched uh, the ground corn of the Hopi sacred grandfather, Dan, when my wonderful partner, Hopi shaman, Susan Ambrose there. And that, as I spoke many times, that Hopi sacred cornmeal would call the wind every time you could call the wind with that cornmeal. And I watched and it did. And that corn was literally genetically a family pet for hundreds of generations that would only germinate when you sang your family song to it, it the dna in that corn knew the family song similar and, to miss uh, veda austin's uh, water um, ah, very very nice yeah the, 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 so the, the, this is a, a relationship that develops over time called embeddability between the braid pattern density in the dna and that's part of our slideshow this evening versus uh, the long wave in the land. And how that long wave embeds is a very useful introduction to the physics of God, as it were. And the reason that this is a vector equilibrium is the next point I would like to make. So uh, Dave called this n-dimensional vector distribution. And, you know, there's lots of purely mathematical conversations you could have about this. But if you happen to be an electrical engineer, you might say, the only actual meaning for vector is a direction within which a charge wave can propagate permissively. There actually is no other thing 
that, than a, as a vector than a vector for charge because there is nothing else but charge. Hello. <laughs> Right. So, you know, all the abstract math, mathematical definitions and maps of pure geometry aside, if you're not talking about how a wave of charge is going to propagate, then you have nothing to talk about. So in other words, you can use all the fancy mathematical terms you want, but it doesn't matter. The, well, I'm saying that I'm not saying the, math, the fancy math is not useful. What I'm saying is the ultimate definition of whether the fancy math has predicted something is if you are predicted how waves of charge are going to propagate. Nothing else Gosh. exists actually in physics. So when you say n-dimensional vectors, you mean what is the maximum number of directions from which a wave of charge could converge at one point? Right. And meditating on that after a while, you would sort of eventually come to, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> the dodeci cosacellation of all the platonic solids, which is the study of symmetry, which is the only subject physics has to discuss, is symmetry. And the, subject, the climax form of symmetry is how the platonics nest. And we are next going to show the slides of why and how that is literally the atomic table and literally the completion of the outer valence electron shells of the noble gases for phase conjugate healing and the platinum group metals, gold, palladium, platinum, is specifically the moment when the outer valence electron shell is completed of dodeca eicosa, 5-7 spin pair symmetry, 10-14 electrons, the SPDF, the DF subshells. So completing that nobility defines the nobility of the noble gases and why they're phase conjugate and healing, therify.net, and the physics of gold powder and holy communion and the mana from heaven and why the guild navigators of Dune had to float in a tank of gold water. And I don't mean right. berry gold water. I mean gold water. <laughs> right. Then they were if, floating if you, in a tank of gold water because. <laughs> wow. If you could just give me 30 seconds. I just forgot that I, I got the wrong notebook here with me. Um, if you <laughs> want to continue uh, presenting and I'll be right back. <laughs> that's, that's good. No, I'm, I'm going to have a drink water. Awesome. Sounds good. Actually, hold on one second. Short pause. Deep breath, deep breath. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so we have set the stage at this point. We're thinking about the concept of divine mind or supreme intelligence and what will be the loci, the symmetry of the array, which would permit that maximum embeddability for that maximum charge distribution efficiency that we're calling the supreme intelligence. Obviously, we're thinking of, for example, uh, Karatkov following the Kogi to the place that they made phone calls to their ancestors. We've talked about hundreds of times. And indeed, measuring the fractality of the air, defining the place where ancestor phone calls are possible. And that fractality of the air is a magnetic line cross point, literally a fractal compression node, ancestor phone calls, where Cozy Rev mirrors work for military quality telepathy, et cetera, et cetera. So those sacred dodeca ecosa compression nodes are places where that longitudinal array DNA radio are working. So that is something we've been discussing for many, many episodes here and is a good background for this discussion of what is the physics of God. I mean, to say divine literally means perfectly branched, <laughs> our concept of Deo. And so perfect branching is quite literally the divine and, and uh, infinite, infinite comes from the word phi, all these this has all been in our tradition forever. We're just now understanding that if electrical engineers would teach this, then not only would our children have bliss, the only definition of culture, and we wouldn't need religion wars. Wouldn't that be convenient? <laughs> Right. And also by, by doing this so in nature, you would be able to, through the alleged tether between us, all of us as humans, as, you know, fractalized, uh, you know, shards of the source, if you will, be able to feel and experience the emotions of others. So it would be far more difficult for, say, someone like myself to say, you know what, if I'm in a position of power, I want to go to war because I'd be able to feel what everyone else is feeling. Beautifully said, David. 
Thank you for saying that. You said that perfectly. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Your work has yet. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, that's that's what that's why embeddability defines compassion, and we have been defining the physics of compassion in terms of the EKG for a hundred years. Am I that old? Oh, uh, realheartcoherence.com. So literally, the EKG's electric field turns inside out recursively, and the EKG becomes harmonic inclusive. And that implosive fractal compression identifies compassion and embedding. And I feel you inside of me. And therefore, I won't hurt you because you are me, et cetera. So embeddability electrical engineering is clearly not just the physics of compassion, but the physics of the end of war, because we can feel each other. And how we become that body collectively is what this is about for electrical engineers and biologists. Wow, right. That embeddability, yes. So now I have set the stage for a few slides, hopefully. Uh, share screen, let's see. Okay, whenever. Okay, now you would think that um, keynote implosion full sequence. Okay, so um, remember, we're talking about the chemistry of vector equilibrium, vector equilibrium charge distribution. So, and we're, we're going to use this slide here to show this platonic symmetry. So here, you should be seeing this uh, platonic nature of the periodicity of the elements graphic. Yes, good. Um, so notice that um, essentially the electron shells here, uh, the S, P, D, F suborbital, which are all the electrons in the atomic table, the S suborbital is simply a toroidal teardrop top, and the pi, P suborbital is tetracubic, uh, three vortex pairs, six vortex, six electron, and the dodeca ecosa DF subshell, five, seven spin pair, 10, 14 electron, are dodeca ecosa. That's the point. And when those are full, then you get the complete star mother nest I just showed you. And, and that's true, not just of the electron shell interdigitation called the electron shell valence of the whole atomic table, but that is also true of the arrangement of the hadrons, protons, and neutrons of the nucleus. As Professor Moon showed, University of Chicago, the platonic hadron symmetries are uh, platonic. The, the protons and neutrons and the whole atomic table are tetra cube octi cosa. And that is fractal to the electrons. Point being that when the dodeca e cosa valence electrons are filled, that column on the far right would be the noble gases, helium, neon, and they're called noble because those outer electron shells are full. That is, they don't, they, they're uncorrodable because they don't need to suck somebody in. They're complete, but also they're conjugate, which also is then true of fullerenes, uh, that they're dodecaecosa and therefore conjugate and therefore negentropic. And that is also then true of the platinum group metals, gold, palladium, platinum. So they set up that condition for charge distribution efficiency, literally a vector equilibrium. And what here, I don't know if you can see my little screen, but the vector equilibrium here is what Buck, Bucky taught me personally. He called this a ve vector equilibrium. He's right. The tensors were balanced in the pulling and pushing, which was a purely mechanical model for Bucky of what he meant by vector equilibrium. But if you extend that profoundly and radically to the electrical meaning, you arrive at the concept of how the waves phase conjugate in their implosion toward the center. And that's what we want to talk about now, because that implosion enables that DNA radio, which is the longitudinal wave that squirts from that center. So now we're going to go to a different set of screen shares here. So we talked about the atomic table. Now we want to talk about after that pine cone implodes perfectly to center and uh, converges at the Planck dimension very accurately to enable the squeezing process that converts the transverse EMF to longitudinal propagation at the Planck threshold where the pine cones kiss noses. So we want to look at those pictures. And for that, we're going to use the longitudinal keynote. Here we are, keynote longitudinal share. And there, now we're going to open this longitudinal and we go to slide numbers 30 to 38. So here's this is this is the, the you see the golden ratio fractal of Mandelbrot here, right? Yes. Yeah. So if you take that golden ratio, which defines the fractality of Mandelbrot 
among many other things, and you animate, and you've seen this many times. So that converging process of implosion at center enables that longitudinal wave to be spit out at the center point where it converges at the Planck threshold. And so all of these dodeca ecosa wave nodes are about setting up these perfect pine cones, which are doing this imploding business to enable that compression into the center of the pine cone where at Planck, the wave spits out at specifically in a longitudinal array, which is the mind of God. And so what we're, we're thinking about now that enabling that implosion is what sets, for example, in your DNA, the conditions up for where you can be embedded in that array. You know, the, the Aboriginals called it a song line. They felt the compression there. They felt the still point. The Kogi went to phone their ancestors there. And so that implosion process, we've modeled it many ways where the it's possible as this soap bubble shows where it really sucks, that you could change scale without changing ratio, which identifies non-destructive compression and therefore implosion. So that dodeca in that soap bubble was able to change scale without, without changing ratio, which is what the dodeca ecosa uniquely enables. And that enables all our famous stories about pine cones and almonds and valentines and hearts and, and grail legends. And that's what the star mother kit is. And so we took that into equations and showed that then predicts newly the structure of hydrogen, Planck times Goldman ratio, three hydrogen radii, and then our published equations show how that non-destructive implosive charge collapse creates the acceleration of charge towards center named the gravity, the adding and multiplying the phase velocities. And so that then explains why the universe is dodeca, ecosa, and fractal, and even the arrangement of masses in the universe is dodeca, ecosa, which is a smoking gun to saying that uh, if the universe's masses and the earth grid are all dodeca, ecosa, there must be a reason for that, that charge distribution efficiency enabled is also how you stabilize gravity and therefore atmosphere. Um, so now we, we go to the next section of this, um, which is, uh, no, stop this share. So the next part of this would be to see how the onset of human coherent emotion and bliss enables that embedding in the DNA that, remember, DNA implodes and becomes toroidal, and embeds itself in a longer wave of coherence is actually braided into DNA by implosion from the phonon low frequencies of heart brain at the moment of bliss. And that wave mechanic is then embedding you into that longer wave and literally enabling your participation in that array, literally a holographic fractal array of the divine intelligence. So there's some uh, little DNA pictures, which you've seen before. But before I do that, any, any questions, Dave, at this point or? No, actually, as a matter of fact, all of the notes that I had, I had spoken to you about uh, prior when I emailed you saying, let's do episode two on this speaks, I mean, primordially to all of what you're saying here, sir. And I'm not saying that for the sake of, you know, uh, tooting your own horn in this regard, because we're on this call here. But I mean, it, it's, I mean, yeah, no questions, all, all in agreement. Well, and so then when we said, when you said n-dimensional vector distrib distribution, the concept of what is the maximum number of dimensions which can be superposed at one point equals the question of what is the maximum number of waves of charge which can converge at one point which is parallel to the question of what is the next maximum number of superposed axes of charge spin rotation which can be converged at one point and we are suggesting here specifically that if you want to rot superpose as, as many axes of spin at one point as possible DNA may be the best example in the universe because, you know, of course, the, do the codon array is tetracubic, but then that's embedded with a dodeca ratchet, which is embedded within a braid with a braid with a braid with a braid. So suddenly we have a map to how to get the most short waves into the most long waves. <laughs> Can you, could this be also done by a term called scalar commensurability? Well, we're, remember, the, the term scalar has, the primary meaning in physics, scalar refers to the amplitude of a vector and is actually not helpful in terms of what Tesla referred to as longitudinal waves, as scalar waves. So using the term longitudinally projective 
uh, electromagnetic fields is more precise than scalar in this sense of uh, longitudinal coherent interferometry. So we're using the term longitudinal to avoid the ambiguity of using the term scalar in physics because it has other meanings. Fantastic. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And but what, but again, what we're but it's your question still uh, commensurate is close to the idea of embedding. And remember, okay. the, pro the problem of maximum embedding or perfect nesting is precisely the problem the fractality of golden ratio solves. Embeddability perfected is the definition of what golden ratio is. And we prove that in wave mechanics electrically, not just in the philosophy. It's more than the philosophy of beauty. It is the wave mechanics of perfected compression and embedding. And so we wanted to just now poetically look at that in DNA, share screen. The DNA section is uh, full sequence, slide number 227. All right, I'm going to get better at this. Yes, okay. No cool. worries. It, it, sir, if I may ask as well, right before you, you carry on, does this also um, directly speak to not only your, your work, but also uh, Mr. Bearden's work as well? Well, you know, Bearden was a great inspiration to us for sure. I worked with him for many years and we spoke at many psychotronics conferences together. It's too bad he didn't uh, get off the Southern diet and get his hygiene together. <laughs> but his, his equations showing that longitudinal EMF waves are the physics of gravity waves in his book entitled Gravito Biology, showing the longitudinal waves are precisely why plants grow in a pitch black basement. If you send the longitudinal waves of the sun into that pitch black basement, the plants grow fine. So longitudinal wave is not just the physics of what a gravity wave is, but the physics of what triggers plant growth, longitudinal compression, because obviously if it's imploding well, then it sucks. And that's the difference between a live seed and a dead seed. And that's all in gravitobiology, Tom Beard's book, we discussed nicely at the bottom of fractalfield.com slash vacuum energy. Thank you. Yeah. And, you know, Beard Bearden correctly talked about the military. And there's obviously all kinds of difficult military applications here. And anything powerful is going to also be dangerous. But hello, if you don't know what a longitudinal wave is, you can't talk to God. So yes, maybe we have to be a threat to national security in order to talk to God. Mm. <laughs> could that, gotcha. could, could mm -hmm. that be a conundrum? But no, <laughs> Bearden, you know, and for example, just one practical example, since you bring up Tom Bearden, he was for years talking about the danger of what he called the Russian woodpecker, which was a chirp, a heterodyne chirp, which was scalar longitudinal interferometry. And he looked up and saw a rib effect of a coherent array of clouds in a rectilinear grid extending for miles, directly triggered by the longitudinal interferometry of the Russians. And he's right, you know, oh dear, we got to be afraid of the Russians. Well, you know, they, they got the, uh, the RF uh, uh, conjugate RF radar scientists from Germany. We got the rocket engineers, but actually Russia got the good ones. <laughs> is this why, sir, it's been, not to detract too much, but is this why it's been alleged that after the, the um, I guess you could say the, the American CIA, you name it, realized that what, you know, has been coined as remote viewing amongst many other things is in fact real. That's why they started using tactics where, for example, uh, when they realized that the Russians were spying on them via things like remote viewing and what have you, they would think a thought and then discuss in dialogue verbally the actual conversation to sort of as a, as a counter in intelligence tactic. Yes, I, actually, the uh, Elena assures us that the advanced ETs regard uh, shields from remote viewers as primitively simple. <laughs> so wow. when Courtney Brown at the Farsight Institute remote viewed, oh, and they thought Putin was being manipulated by the Greys, the Kumar, the reticulum. Actually, the Greys were manipulating Courtney Brown. <laughs> it, that's it, it, it's. I don't want to pick on Courtney Brown and Farsight Institute. I think their remote viewing skill is 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 amazing. However, uh, I don't think they're aware of the fact that advanced cultures have long learned to create membranes against remote viewers. For example, they say there's a remote viewer alarm at Area 51. Well, it's more than that. Once you know what remote viewing is, which is a longitudinal compressional node that you take with you, obviously, there are ways to make a shield for that. And you're right, the diversion of attention is part of that. It's literally a bubble. It's literally a bubble. And wow. And, and so uh, the point is that when we taught Monroe Institute the correct brainwave signature to trigger remote viewing, uh, which is 
flamingmind.com slash flaming sound, the perfect binaural. And it literally drives you <laughs> implosively, plasma projectively, longitudinally into the array. It's clearly the physics of remote viewing, as in fact, therify.net is proven replicably to trigger lucid dreaming. Similar you physics. guys taught the remote view, the, the Monroe Institute, the, the, I guess you could say the more refined tactic of that? Or, uh, uh, it, was, it was Claude Swanson with Monroe. And then, of course, I knew Laurie Monroe for years. Uh, and, uh, you know, they were using, in fact, our team took uh, Flame in Mind there and showed them, hello, you can teach this more. You see, here's how it started. Ed Wilson was uh, Bob Monroe's research leader, MD, this is 30 years ago. And uh, when he showed uh, Bob Monroe that golden ratio heterodynes in the uh, binaural beats, uh, drove people out of their head. I mean, it was explosive. And Monroe says, ooh, that's dangerous. We better not do that. So Ed, Ed Wilson, MD, the famous research director for Bob Monroe, quit and drove to my farm and made a film with me about it. I mean, that's how, that's how I got wow. to know Lori Monroe. And so then, then uh, our friends from Belgium who were on the board, of, it's a bit of a long story, Monroe Institute. But Forgive yeah, me, I, I wasn't around for this, but I, I wish I was. <laughs> Oh, we had some fun. We have some. But the point is, the reason a golden ratio binaural beat bliss heterodyne audio trigger, flameandmind.com slash flame and sound, will trigger phonon implosion in your head and literally drive you through the top of your head. If you're ready, <laughs> you know, it's great. However, if you ain't ready, which means if you are not a shareable wave yet, it, 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 it's called fractionation versus fractality. <laughs> it means that- And if you're not ready- if you're not ready, that would that would lead to things like, for example, what we discussed last week about anxiety, stress, uh, creating such fract uh, fractalization, so you cannot non destructively self implode. Well, yes, it would mean that you weren't ready for bliss or death or lucid dreaming. You hadn't sorted your emotions, and therefore you were not able to identify with a shareable wave, and literally propagate coherently in that array. So right. it's perfectly analogous to Drinvalo saying, well, it's all hex flower of life and don't do the pent unless you're ready because it's dangerous. Well, yeah, but if you don't do the pent, then you're susceptible to parasites. So there's a there's a catch 22 here. So basically, gotcha. you got to get ready to be shareable, which means sort your emotions to be able to identify with waves that only serve God. I mean, the collective, I mean, the divine intelligence. Oh, that was the subject of this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay. So, but we were getting to the DNA animation. So when the harmonics of your spine liquid and your braid and your breath feed that implosion process, then your DNA does this embeddability trick. And those are the pictures we were supposed to show at this point in the slide number two, two, seven. Too many movies, too little time. Where we hear that for? Two, two, seven. All right, here it is. So this is the implosive process. You all know the defined harmonics of that cascade, which is the phonon harmonics of pure implosion in blue and the, the harmonics of Schumann harmonics in green, which are the brainwave alpha beta of bliss. And they trigger this in your DNA, the braid implosion. You've all seen these before. And there's that golden ratio rectangle where the hydrogen bond is at the center of every ladder rung of DNA, pure implosion in the hydrogen. And that then short wave bond is recursively braid embedded in a longer and longer wave in that braid imploding process. And that becomes the Heinrich Clouvet form constants and ting and geometric extensions of consciousness and exactly what you're going to see at the moment of death, this lattice cobweb tunnel spiral and that braiding process enables you to implode and you'll feel that compression at the moment of death as your entire life passes by <laughs> because you have to review the compression process. And so that braid on the braid of the braid in the braid, and you've all seen that longer wave then embeds. And here's where the longer wave, the short wave embeds in the longer wave in the DNA until the point at which the DNA actually becomes toroidal. The plot thickens. And this is what we've been teaching for years. Goldenmean.info slash DNA manifesto. We have lots of articles. Here's where with Glenn Ryan, we measured the effect of uh, braiding a, of heart coherence. We measured the effect of this heart coherence on on low frequency, what I taught Heart Math Institute to do. And we measured the effect on DNA. I'm the one who told, suggested to Glenn Ryan to make that measurement. And, and so that, that braid then embeds shortwave and the long wave. And you've all seen those animations. 
And that's a wave within a wave waving. And when that embedding process becomes recursive or fractal. Isn't this what Ed Witten called M theory? Ah, <laughs> Allegedly. I don't yep. know. <laughs> that's, that's oh, okay. It's, it's speaking to topology, speaking to, to of course, the toroid field and the, the non-destructive uh, self-implosion. Yes. Oh, well, um, that's interesting. It, maybe that relates to embedding. This is showing the braid of the braid in the braid, the magnetic X. This is showing the Celtic knot applied to DNA. And this is, shows when the DNA turns inside out, which is called palastration. And here's the final slide in this series that after the DNA turns inside, this is actual photomicrograph of a DNA in a torus donut. Very long wave embedded, all based on golden ratio. I lied, it wasn't the last slide. That, that's the photomicrograph of the, of the DNA in a torus, bottom right. And you get that vortex, and that's called Lord of the Ring. Okay, <laughs> stop screen, screen share. So there's Frodo, who has this ring that if he has pure intention, which is if he can consistently imagine a shareable thought in his mind, eventually this magnetic plasma current, this big worm is going to follow him around. And the long waves will do his bidding. Uh, it's related to the concept of egregore in Moni Sadhu, the very long wave plasma intelligences. And this is a relatively useful introduction to the short physics of God. <laughs> Does this also speak to ancient cultures um, referring to the serpent rope, if you will? Yes, yes. And, and, uh, and the aboriginals have a hundred names for the serpent bird man, Quetzalcoatl Veracoca, which happens to be another name for Thoth Hermes, who has just returned with the nine in the meetings on Ganymede, the cedar races. So Hermes had an agenda with that caduceus he brought here, which is today called phase conjugation, which was to plant a seed which could give us a soul, which could make our DNA actually interesting. <laughs> Does this, sir, also speak to the, um, again, I don't mean to conflate or, or jump all over the place, but in particularly within Asian cultures, the dragon. The, yes. The, the, yeah. Well, you know, my friend David Yarrow wrote the book Dragon in the Ice Castle, in which he observed the giant plasma worms in the earth. And at, at times, those plasma worms would come out of the earth and sail, literally, observably, giant plasma intelligences. You could see them emerge from the earth. And uh, we did the ritual with the, um, with the Bon Po, actually, uh, with the Tibetans in Calgary. And they used uh, truckloads of incense to acupuncture the earth with a flame that would burn for 100 feet high for days. And they called giant plasma worm dragons. And these were uh, plasma intelligences of planetary size that advanced shaman would uh, make an ally of, <laughs> for better or for worse. But if you got a big tornado you need to steer, there's nothing better to have around. Your, your family pet is this plasma intelligence the size of a giant fire-breathing dragon. These plasma intelligence are real. This is not just myth. So these ancient texts of, you know, the, uh, some, some texts, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, forgive me for those in the audience if, if I'm butchering this a bit, but the whole concept of the, the feeling the serpent or the dragon within you, does that speak to what we may now call Kundalini these days? Precisely, uh, having spent 30 years studying and doing the physics of Kundalini and having just produced the documentary, goldenmean.info slash Kundalini, but that's precisely what it is. So you got that low frequency, heart rate variability, phone on wave, sacrocranial pump, mayor wave, pumping that spine liquid with the intense microwave component. And then that explodes out the amygdala, the serpent brain into the bird brain. And there's that draining of the ventricle horn, crystallizing the ventricles, that whole biophysics kundalini. And it feels like a giant serpent is stinging your tailbone and, <laughs> and, and burning its way up your spine. And that is dramatic and sexual and powerful and dangerous and evolving if you survive. Well, to that point, sir, and I, I'd like to say, uh, I guess this is a little bit of a question per se, but this speaking to your work of longitudinal wave interferometry, part of my notes as of the day I was emailing you about n-dimensional uh, um, vector spaces and all of this had to do with something in psychology that I found called uh, defense mechanism testing or DMT, go figure, just like the, the drug. But what's interesting is that I wrote down some notes here, which is that 
some of the uh, subjects were exposed to uh, what you could call traumatizing uh, experiences and how they would react to that. Now, what's interesting is that they appear to uh, react to those, um, I guess you could say, uh, events over time, therefore making immediate observational conclusions quite faulty. Now, what's interesting here is that Sandler and Joff in 1969 pointed to the parallels between a perceptual microgenesis and the progressions of conflict, anxiety, and defense observed in psychoanalysis. Now, what's interesting is that the findings of such parallels seem to be intrinsically appropriate given that both require time to unfold, therefore taking equal time to observe, which speaks, sir, to your longitudinal wave interferometry, if that makes sense. Well, there's some interesting thoughts that uh, comment I would make. We, we, it's famous among the secret space program survivors uh, that uh, negative ETs uh, use trauma to fractionate personalities and thus uh, isolate memories. So one of the primary results of trauma, obviously, is uh, discontinuities in memory. And almost all forms of healing are essentially the restoration of continuity of memory. For example, uh, you know, the traumatic thing that happened to you when you were very young, uh, you, you hid away that memory. And that break in memory is actually a break in the plasma serpent of your psyche, actually. So when you go back and recover the memory of the moment of maximum pain, and then you reassemble your memory, suddenly it implodes again and you're whole. And the reason negative ET use, use trauma to break up personalities is then they use the set personalities as separate fragments. So the opposite of that is the healing that results from a fusion, which is when memories are reassembled. So the key point of, for example, when the dentist was drilling your tooth, if you did not use a painkiller and then your memory did not become discontinuous, you would then heal faster. <laughs> Right. Okay. Now, with that said as well, too, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'll be very direct in this question here. I've been having discussions, particularly on my, uh, on, on my end of things, on, on our member side, on Patreon, about um, uh, the, the alleged trauma that people go through, particularly males, during uh, circumcision. Is this something that within the, the ancestral memory could traumatize a child as well? Yeah. I mean, I think it's obvious circumcision, circumcision is a horror, disgusting tradition that arrived from the same fear of sexuality that animated the origin of most religions that probably indirectly or directly, it's all a Draco plot. It's, I mean, at least, at least the bad guys put it there. No, clearly that discontinuity member has deep and profound implications because it makes the the orgasm a shorter wave experience it's it's really a nasty and insidious practice it's in my view it's as evil horribly evil as female genital genetic genital uh, mutilation and uh clearly the, the the root of many ways and reasons which inhibit the ability of a long wave bond even Tantra to form between men and women, absolutely. Which is another reason we have to get past these stupid religions and understand some physics, otherwise we're condemned to such crap. <laughs> Right. And speaking of that, that long wave bond, uh, uh, again, forgive me but more so to the audience if we're jumping all over the place here, but I I've recently been exploring the idea to everything we've been saying here, uh, to your work as well, sir, to your point of allowing the task to define the tool, if that makes sense. I, and what I find interesting is about that is your work, particularly speaking, again, to longitudinal wave interferometry seems to do that. But again, I don't want to put words in, in your mouth. That's just my <laughs> observation. Well, let's see. Our task was to understand God and our tool was wave mechanics. <laughs> right. Did, did our tool fit the task? Well, <laughs> right. it, but it is true that being an electrical engineer, it, it, everything, that's my hammer. So to my, as an electrical engineer, everything who has only a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So uh, all problems are electrical, according to me. <laughs> does, right. does my tool fit my task? <laughs> <laughs> and, and one other thing I did want to ask as well, too, is that it's been stated recently within, you know, as you could say, um, I guess, uh, surface level academia or physics, and this is no disrespect to anyone out there, but that, for example, there are certain cases where you have 
non-magnetic fields, but you have very strong right angle toroidal geometries. Can those right angle toroidal geometries be postulated with intent? Which is why you, a magnetic force may not need to be present in such instances? Mm, I think that's a little bit of a complicated question. What a fun one. <laughs> well, uh, first of all, for example, people that say some waves are non-Hertzian, I think that's a lousy way to say some waves have imploded to a convergent still point, enabling a connection with longitudinal. That's what people mean when they say non-Hertzian. You know, not, to say non-Hertzian means it doesn't vibrate, which actually is a sin in physics, because you cannot say anything doesn't vibrate if you happen to be a physicist. Right. <laughs> and so then to say something is non-magnetic, you, you see, actually in physics, everything is electromagnetic, obviously. And the difference between electrical and magnetic is just the perpendicular relationship of where the flux is on the torus. One, one perpendicular at 90 degrees to the other is magnetic versus... So everything is like... So even to say something is non-magnetic is actually sinful because in a sense, there is flux everywhere and there is nothing but flux. <laughs> How can wow, you say what okay. the unified field is made of when it's made of everything? So you cannot name the substance which makes everything ether charge. Well, that is charge. Charge is flux. It's electromagnetic. So again, to say something is not electromagnetic is a metaphor pointing somewhere, but really it's not a very helpful language. So that's like saying I went swimming, but there was no water. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yeah. But but there was there was an ending to your question. Where did your question go at the end? And you were saying, does that imply? Because what's really oh intent? Ah, yes, intent. Thank you. That's where we wanted to go with this. Very good. So when that person said this wave is non-Hertzian, which is a very confused, lousy language, what he really meant was it imploded to a still point and propagated longitudinally. That's what they really meant. And when that happened, it only happens in the circumstance of phase conjugate embedding, relating long wave to short wave, and therefore, actually, when enough long waves nest on a short wave, the concept of intent is precisely what arises. Specifically, you know, to use a childish example, in Deep Space Nine, in the movie, you finally realize that that giant wormhole vortex plasma tube Stargate, actually, when you go into that Stargate, you realize the Stargate vortex itself has intent. Oh my goodness. That means the portal driving you to the other side of the galaxy in the Stargate, that wormhole, it needs to like you. <laughs> oh, crap. That's that, was, why... that was the storal to the Mori. <laughs> right. And that's what, okay. So now does this potentially sort of speak to about 20, 25 years ago, there was an attempt to sort of bring what the uh, American government's been covering up uh, through through, you know, Dr. Uh, Greer and otherwise um, pertaining to uh, certain vehicles called flux liners. I, when I think of flux liner, I think of riding the, that wave, that longitudinal wave. Uh, I think uh, Jose Arguez called it in Surfers of the Zavuya, he called it ride the long wave, Uncle Joe. <laughs> wow. And the longitudinal is a long wave and it is a flux liner. You know, but what it really means is that um, there is no such thing as a powerful plasma vortex, which being large and longitudinal, it's part of mind by definition. Otherwise, it would not be sustainable. That's why it is fundamental to realize the most intelligent being in our solar system is the sun by definition. And every shaman knows, you know, every religion is really a sun god religion. And every shaman knows when you go to the heart of the sun, it's the only way in and out of here, actually. And by the way, it's a stargate to Andromeda. And by the way, it needs to like you. <laughs> right. It needs to. Wow. 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 So is... where, how did the intent arise in a plasma vortex the size of half a galaxy? Well, <laughs> it's a very long wave, Uncle Joe. <laughs> so wow. yes, it has needs and wants. It would like gene pools to grow up and become stars because that's what gene pools are for. Wow. That's, I'm, I mean, uh, forgive me to your audience if I keep saying wow. It's just, I mean, I'm, I'm a, at a personal point of realization of some of this. And it's just, it's, it's clicking, whether you want to call it topology, uh, M yeah. theory, uh, all that, all those, all that lingo. It's the, it's the same thing. 
Yeah, it's about our concept of mind was very parochial here. Once you realize that that medical doctor during their near death experience was looking at their half dead body from somewhere in the room, and you realize that was a plasma vortex that survived death. And you electrical engineers start thinking about what's in that plasma vortex that's seeing you from outside you. Then you get a bigger idea of what mind is. Anything that can support the propagation of that plasma vortex, which, by the way, aluminum boxes, no. Right. <laughs> Sun gods, stars, yes. <laughs> you know, biologic material the size of a forest, yes. Uh, what if the hospital was in the shape of a spiral? Just curious. Well, if it was made of biological material and wasn't so full of electrosmog crap, you know, and they yeah. douse the magnetic lines. In short, bioarchitects.net, build living architecture. It's the same as building living microchips. Wow. Wow. Holy crap. This is, I mean, I just want to say also, if I could say for, for Dan's audience, I know he'll be putting this up on his end. This has been nothing but nothing short of absolutely fantastic it's taken me many months to grasp it but now that i have it's it's incredible it's actually as as dan says quite often it's it, now i look at shapes and i when they're when they're not fractalized i go wow how beautiful it, it's it's a totally different shift in perspective because the waves in the fractal are imploding and they're embedding and communing with the divine mind the divine intelligence so literally we can be part of divine intelligence by understanding it you know with physics and therefore, we can reinvent our architecture, we reinvent our diet, we reinvent the way we think. It's Castaneda was actually right. Every time you walk into a room, you look for the place of power, because that's where the plasma implosion will grow your aura, which then needs to grow big enough to steer the sun. Otherwise, you ain't growed up. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll be honest with you, sir. I'm, I'm just about... Uh... Uh, finished with respect to my questions and the notes that I took in preparation to this. I mean, you took it to to a whole other level, but I mean, this is this is absolutely resonating with all of the other work and, and people I've spoken to, you name it. So I, I can't thank you enough once again. Well, thank you. So hopefully we've answered the basic question. Do we have some, as you say, tools to think about the actual short physics of God. So our sense of there's a divine presence now has real electrical meaning and substance, that longitudinal array inhabiting. And we can be part of that array in biologic architecture, in ritual, in bliss practice, in live food, in yoga. But we cannot be part of that array when we're in metal buildings full of electrosmog and dead air and uh, looking at trivial things that don't bring our attention to pure principle. Right. Wow. Well, without further ado, I mean, I, I just want to thank you once again, Dan, this has been extremely, I, I, I don't really like to use this word per se, but I will for the sake of this um, enlightening, or maybe I should say embedding, if that's more, <laughs> more appropriate, but I, I can't thank you enough, sir. It's been an embeddable evening. Thank you, Dave. We had fun. Thank you. Bless Take you. care. See you again soon. Bye-bye. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.